Hello, everyone. I've got something very exciting and exceptional for you today. It's an interview with Robert Eisenman, the famous Dead Sea Scrolls scholar. You may have heard of him. He's all over the Internet. This particular interview, under an hour, I consider to be the best I've ever heard. I know Dr. Eisenman very well. I call him Bob. He calls me Jim. Uh, I met him in December of 1991 and through January 92, and guess where? At the site of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the caves all around us at Qumran on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. And we stayed there a month. I brought a team from UNC Charlotte of my students, and we did archaeological survey work, radar ground scan all over the area with some very significant results. Also, we surveyed the caves south all the way to Ein Gedi, if you look on a map. Each team had a kilometer. I'll never forget my kilometer because I spent three weeks climbing and checking with my students, photographing, looking at caves and so forth. And it was just south of Wadi Kidron. Now, I remember the Kidron River or ravine or Wadi Kidron properly called because it's not flowing with water all the time. So Kidron runs all the way down to the Dead Sea. On the way, you see a famous monastery, Mar Saba. The reason I love this interview is you really get to see Bob Eisenman, the man, talks about his early life, his education, how he got into the Dead Sea Scrolls. His PhD is not even in Christian origins or the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in Islamic law in the 19th and 20th centuries as applied in the Holy Land, Columbia University. But he gradually did move into the Dead Sea Scrolls and other kind of Hebraic studies and early Christian studies. Let me show you his website. It's going to be easy to remember if you can remember his name. He has a wonderful website. Okay, this is the website, roberteisenman.com. So if you remember his name, you got it. All kinds of stuff here, books and everything about him. I'm going to emphasize the books. Uh, this is interesting. It's the newest one, the Dead Sea Scrolls Monopoly. This tells the actual story of how all the Dead Sea Scrolls were finally released. And only Eisenman knows the real inside story because he's the one that was able to obtain the photographs that were finally published. In fact, in that December 91, January 92, when I was with him, those photos had just come out. We had them with us at Qumran, and we were able to begin studying them, and he had given me some even a year before. So his best-known book is probably the book on James. It might be heavy to start with. I would recommend people maybe start with this, The Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christians, as just a survey. There's also here, James, the brother of Jesus, and the scrolls one and two, abridged versions of the big James and the New Testament code. So you could go that route, but I would just go with this first to get an idea. And then if you want to try these, you could do that, or you could even do the summaries that I, I just mentioned. Uh, I see another one here. I haven't read it yet. I've Need to get it. I didn't realize it was out. The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Roots of Christianity and Islam. Uh, Eisenman is an expert in Islamic studies. He's made the point that Islam was very influenced indirectly, not directly by the Dead Sea Scrolls, but by the kind of Ebionite Judeo-Christian so-called that comes from James, the brother of Jesus, that end up after the Jewish war and after Bar Kokhba, 135 CE, migrating down into the Arabian Peninsula. And we know that's the case. And Muhammad, remember, studied in a cave and so forth. So there is some influence there or some interchange, at least, so that the Jews that Muhammad dealt with were not just the mainstream Jewish communities of the towns of Arabia, but also more Ebionite kinds of groups that were minority versions of Christianity who did not see Jesus as God, for example. And of course, in Islam also, Jesus is not God. So I'll stop the share.
and we'll get started on the interview. I hope you enjoy it. Take care, everybody. I had been in uh, the East Coast environment and also in Israel. I had uh, gone to Ivy League universities. I had studied originally things like engineering physics and then philosophy and literature and things like that at Cornell. I originally thought I wanted to be a nuclear physicist and so on. And I suddenly realized that I didn't really like the sort of uh, colleagues I was encountering in that line of activity. So I moved over into philosophy and that was interesting but rather dry. And finally I got into literature. So I thought I was going to be a writer. And after college, I did what most uh, most writers think they're going to do. They go off uh, into the world. In my view, since Paris was supposed to be the bohemian writing center of the world, I took off as fast as I could to Paris and the left bank. And that was in the late 50s. So I started traveling around and Vienna had always uh, appealed to me. I went into the, some people in Paris recommended I go into the Austrian Alps to do some writing. So I did, made a lot of good friends there. And that wasn't enough for me. So I kept moving to Turkey and Istanbul and Athens and so on. And I was gonna to go to a Greek island. So I went to Idra, because it was the closest to the, uh, to the, to the Greek mainland. Still trying to do some writing. And, uh, uh, and I went back to, I went back to uh, Europe and Paris and hung out in those kinds of places, went to Kibbutzim in Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to NYU in a course called Hebrew and Near East Studies. And I originally got a scholarship in Hebrew. Then when I wanted to do a doctorate, I went to Columbia and I didn't have any in Hebrew. I got one in Arabic. I went to Columbia for my doctorate in Middle East languages and cultures, and I did a dissertation on Islamic law. So I said, well, I want to go back to Israel. So I wrote a book, I wrote a dissertation so I could get fellowship aid on Islamic law in Mandate, Palestine, and modern Israel. That's now published from E.J. Brill in Leiden. So I did my work, as you see, in Islamic studies. I had a background in you know, Hebraic, uh, Bible, all these other things from my earlier interests on the kibbutz family when I was reading these things privately, but I never really formally studied them that much. You know, general survey courses. So when after I finished my doctorate, which took me five years to write and so on, uh, at that time jobs were freezing up in America and there weren't a lot of jobs going and I was offered a job at a place called Cal State Long Beach in the Religious Studies Department. As a course, to be able to teach a good course, Islamic law. Well, no one was going to take a course in Islamic law. I didn't realize at the time that you had to fill the courses up. Jerry Brown was governor, actually, at that time still. And, you know, he had made, you, know, you had to have a minimum number of, uh, of bodies in the course for it to go. So if you didn't fill it, it didn't go. So I had to start teaching courses that would go. And th that meant people were interested in Christianity. That's what people were interested in, Jesus, the Bible. <laughs> courses like that would go. If you get an Islamic, now you could get an Islamic civilization course to go, but back then they wouldn't even know what it was. So one course that was on the book was intertestament literature. Well, who's gonna take a course in, inter in intertestament literature? They wouldn't even know what it was. So I changed the title because I had taken a Dead Sea Scrolls course for my master's at NYU in Hebrew and Near East Studies, Dead Sea Scrolls. So I changed it to Dead Sea Scrolls. I thought that was a catchy title and people started registering. And I had to teach it every single term. Now people at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you name it, those kind of universities, they teach one or two, even three courses maybe a year. We had to teach four courses a term. It was mandated by state law. You had to get these courses to go. So that was bad and good because those chaps, as decent scholars as they are, 
don't really have to uh, do a lot of teaching, therefore they don't learn a lot outside of their main field. I have to teach, 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 and in teaching you learn, 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 learn. And that's what happened to me. I began to know the Dead Sea Scrolls because I had the whole collections of them backwards and forwards. I began to know the New Testament backwards. I had to teach a New Testament course. I invented a course called Paul and James because I discovered who they were by reading these courses. I didn't even know there was a guy called James when I started all, all, all of this. You know, and when I was reading the book of Acts, it, it jumped out at me. Who, who is this person, you know? Particularly in the we portion of, of Acts, the later portion, you know, he becomes very important. And you realize he's the leader of the early church, if you read it carefully. And then and, 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 and Paul is in conflict with him. And who would have known that? I wouldn't have known that. You wouldn't teach it, at, you learn it at graduate school. You only learn it through teaching, teaching, reading the text over and over and over and again. Well, this is how I got into the fields which I got into. And then I started writing in those fields and all the rest is um, history. So that's why, that's how I got into these fields. I started writing on the Dead Sea Scrolls. From the Dead Sea Scrolls, I wrote about early Christianity. From early Christianity, I got into the issues of what kind of Christianity we're talking about, Palestinian Christianity, overseas Christianity, Pauline Christianity, Romanized Christianity, or Dead Sea Scrolls style Christianity. The, the people who were working in the Greek language to present this to the Roman, Greco-Roman world, they're trying to find words that will reproduce a concept in the Hebrew language and in the scrolls or in the Bible that we're calling uh, uh, Messiah, Moshiach, whatever word you want to, want to apply. And so the closest they could get was this, I don't know where they got it, frankly, this Christus or Crestus at one point someone, someone uses anyway. So the minute you're talking about Christ, Crestus, Christianity, you know you're talking about a, 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 a Greco-Roman sort of production, a Hellenized uh, a, a piece of material um, aimed at a Greco-Roman world. So that's where you get that form from in that, in that kind of um, enclave. But as I discovered, that did not reflect what I later started calling Palestinian Christianity. And it, I, I didn't even like the term Palestinian Christianity because I don't think it was Christianity in Palestine. That's a Greek term. It's really Palestinian Messianism. Palestinian Messianism. And what I discovered in doing the scrolls more and more was that other people who were working on the scrolls but being Christians themselves couldn't see any connection of the scrolls to Christianity because the Christianity they knew was nothing like the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Christianity they know is love, turn the other cheek, otherworldly, you know, etc., et peaceful, and so on. The scrolls are nothing like that. And if, even though they want to try to call the scrolls Essenes, they're not Essenes in the normal sense of the word Essenes because the scrolls are apocalyptic. They are, they are uh, full of anger. They don't love their enemy. They hate their enemy. They say, hate the sons of the pit. Now, if you have a document that says, hate the sons of the pit, how can you, how can you, how can you compare it or even turn it into something that says, love your enemy? So the love your enemy is very attractive. I'm not saying it isn't, isn't attractive, but it doesn't reflect Palestinian messianism. It reflects Greco-Roman Christianity. So the Christ we get in, pictured in the Gospels, as we call them, as they've come to be called, to my mind, as I learn more and more about these things, is highly Paulinized. Because Paul was someone who was uh, familiar with the Greco-Roman world. He seems to have been either born there or, or, or come out of there. He says he's from Tarsus, which, which his family seems to have lived in in southern uh, Anatolia, today's Turkey, which was Hellenistic at that time. But I don't think that he actually is uh, 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 in origin from those areas, I, I came to appreciate and This is where you get really deep into history. And most of the scholars of the scrolls, they're not interested in any of this. They don't go anywhere except, is this word correct? Is that word correct? 
the paleography, the handwriting, this, that. No, they're covering anything up. They, they don't recognize, they don't, yeah, they don't recognize anything here as familiar to them in the Christianity that they know. But they don't know that the Christianity that they know was actually a Greco-Roman production. I just wanted to talk about the mindset of the people working on the scrolls, why they couldn't come to terms with these materials and how their prior belief systems or familiar belief uh, appreciations, um, whether they believers or not, um, influenced their perception of the scrolls. So what, what they felt that the, basically uh, they were trying to say that the, 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 that the scrolls weren't Christian because, as I was telling you, you can't have a document that says hate the sons of the, uh, of the pit that is preaching a final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth <laughs> and so that thinks the holy angels are warrior angels that thinks the whole of that they have to be totally pure because the uh, uh, if they if they are not totally pure they're not they're, they're not uh, unsophisticated people and they're not m simplistic that they think that the that the uh, that they don't have enough power to deal with the might of the Roman emperor empire they need the holy angels who are warrior angels to join their camps as they call them where they're living in order to defeat the might of Rome. They want to defeat the might of Rome. Now, this is not Christianity as we know it. This is Messianism in Palestine, but this is not because these, these hordes, these, these, these hosts, shall we say, of warrior holy angels and the men in the, uh, of, the, of the scroll community are going to be led by the Messiah in this final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth. So what is supposed to happen in their view, and this is in the war scroll we call it, the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. Nobody who is a believing Christian could say this is a Christian document. They just wouldn't recognize it as such, but it's a messianic document. And that's what I tried to begin to clarify. I didn't know it either. But as I taught this material and I saw the, and I began to read through it, and I knew the, the, the establishment reigning theories of scroll studies, I began to see that these did not fit the picture of the materials that I was teaching in my classes. So what I was finding is in the scrolls, and it's fairly consistently so, the scrolls are really pretty consistent. They don't have a, uh, a, um, a document that is opposing another document. The whole mindset is, is more or less the same across the spectrum of the, uh, of the uh, newer documents, shall we call them, uh, the more recently revealed documents. Uh, that, that you don't have, you know, these, these are very consistent documents and they're a very uh, aggressive, apocalyptic messianism. So I started calling this the messianic movement in, in uh, Palestine. I even went further. I even went further, and this is more recently. As I got more, I hate to say sophisticated, but I think I got sophisticated. Since the documents of the scrolls were, were speaking about the sons of Zadok. See, Zadok was the high priest in David's time. So they meant by this priestly in some way. Zadok also can translate into Hebrew ZDK as righteousness, Zedek. So they were playing around with these concepts, playing them on words, righteousness, priesthood, high priesthood, and so on. Since the group in Josephus, the historian of the period, that is supposed to represent the priesthood are the, called the Sadducees, coming from the word Zadok, and you can see that the Sadducees in the New Testament are supposed to be the priestly class, right? Uh, the only problem is we have here a huge problem. The Sadducees in the New Testament or the gospel, shall we say, the pictures that we have there, are collaborating Sadducees. Sadducees collaborating with the Herodian upper class monarchy uh, in, imposed upon Palestine by the Roman Empire and the Roman army and the Roman troops. So King Herod came into power with the defeat of the Maccabees, the, the ones that the Jews celebrate to Hanukkah for, 
the defeat of the Maccabees in the, uh, in the uh, 40s to 30s BC. The Maccabees had taken over sometime in the 60s, 70s, 80s BC period. The wars went on then. So by that time, the Herodian family, was, was, which was not even a Palestinian, uh, not even a Jewish family, actually came from Gaza partially and partially across uh, into Edom, uh, Petra. It was a mixture of that background, but it became Judaized in order that they could become kings in Palestine. So Herod himself was one of these people and he was converted to, quote, Judaism. But this was nothing like the Dead Sea Scrolls Judaism. It was a Pharisee kind of Judaism. That's why most people think of Judaism as Pharisee Judaism. And the New Testament thinks of Judaism as Pharisee Judaism. And the Sadducees are the high priests. Aha! But they're not all the high priests. There's opposition high priests. And that's what we... See, this is really when you start to do this looking deeper into the meaning and substance of the scrolls. Now, the academic curia or establishment that was in control of the scrolls was more interested in translating the documents and didn't really come to terms with the meaning of the, of the documents themselves. So when they saw the term son of sons of Zadok there, it didn't ring a bell to them that these could be Sadducees. How could these documents be Sadducees? No, no, no. These are Essenes. These, these are not Sadducees. But you see, because look, their attitudes don't look like Sadducees in Josephus, Sadducees in the New Testament. What are these? Ah, they're opposition Sadducees. They're Sadducees following the Maccabees who were thrown out of power and went into exile and so on and so forth. But they are, they do claim Zadokite, Sadducee descent. But they are an aggressive, anti-Roman, anti-Herodian, anti-establishment, pro-temple form of Sadduceeism. So I started calling these, people thought I was crazy, but I don't think I'm crazy, Messianic Sadducees. Messianic, I mean, what, what, what? Messianic, how can you have Sadducees who are mess Sadducees are collaborators, they're establishment party, they're, they're this, they're that, they're no good, they, they, they persecute the Christians, they, they throw Jesus into prison, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, but not the Sadducees we're talking about out in the wilderness, out in the Dead Sea Scrolls, waiting for the army of holy angels. Not, not the Sadducees who wrote the documents that we now have which are, in, in fact, the messianic movement of Palestine. That's how I came up with all these things. The problem with Jesus, a Greek name, uh, if we can call him Joshua, Yeshua, whatever, I don't even know what he might have been called in Palestine if he, if he, if, if he had an a, 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 a everyday street name as such, because Yeshua is a very uh, meaningful name, meaning savior. Uh, he who saves, so it's a little bit, uh, yes, or a second Joshua, if you want. So he may have been called that, and I don't say he wasn't. Uh, but the point of the matter is, we don't have any documentation about him except this material coming through the Gospels or spinoffs of the Gospels. So that is a um, that is a whole literature, the the Gospels the pseudo-gospels, the rejected gospels, uh, you know, the extra gospels, the Gnostic gospels, or this gospel, or that. There's a vast literature uh, uh, explosion in that area. That's the data, but that's not necessarily historical. And it may have been based on some original uh, activity that was literary done in some places because we have no Hebrew originals. We have, I'm, there are some Aramaic type gospels, but I think they're taken from the Greek. In any case, I don't even think there's an Aramaic original. I think the originals are in Greek. I may be wrong. Something that comes through very, very strongly in the more autobiographical sections of what is generally referred to as the New Testament. That is the Paul's letters that are mostly the ones that people agree on authentic. People think that they're authentic, but I don't think all of them are authentic, and I don't make these judgments myself 
because I'm not able to say except through internal data what's authentic and what isn't authentic. But there are some letters that people agree on are fairly authentic. And there's some material in the Book of Acts that is fairly historical, not of the kind of the Gospels. So if you look at the Book of Acts, and this is where a believing Christian can actually make these determinations for themselves, his or herself, you notice that the fir first 15 chapters or so of Acts is it's considered written by the same writer who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and Luke seems to be a traveling companion of Paul in Acts, and also in Galatians he's referred to, he seems to be uh, some problem there with Luke and Galatians. <clears throat> in any case, somewhere around chapter 15, up to that point the material resembles the Gospels in its tone, texture, and um, um, uh, outlook. But after chapter 15, it completely changes because the narrative goes from a third-person narrative, he, they, did something, she, to a first-person narrative, I, we. And that's really startling. And we call that the we document because it actually looks like an authentic travel document, a, a, di a di diario, if you want, written by someone, I did this, we did that, I did that, we did that. If you remember, by the time you get to Acts 21, it's saying, Paul and I, we went up to um, Jerusalem and so on and so forth, you know, and, and, and so it's, it's pretty autobiographical at that point, but from a Pauline standpoint. It's not autobiographical about, let's say, Peter. It's not autobiographical, let's say, James. It's from someone who's with Paul, Luke, let us say. And it's first-person narrative, we. Uh, first person plural. And there's, to my mind, historical material there. And I can s give you an example. Acts 21, 21. James speaking. Earlier, we didn't even know who James was. Acts never introduced this James. It did have a James, but he's James, the brother of John. He's not the James talking in Acts 21, 21. He's someone who goes off to Spain, perhaps, or someplace and evaporates, disappears, is killed or whatever it is. He's someone's brother, you see, and that's why you have to have a little bit of suspicion about the earlier version, if he's being written out and changed into a different character. Because as long as he's the brother of someone, then instead of the brother of Jesus, he may be being called the brother of John. But in any case, he disappears. And we don't get a James as a leader of the church, leader of the church, until, until uh, Peter is supposed to be the leader of the church. Peter is supposed to be the rock upon which I build my church. This is all in the Gospels. But you see, in the uh, um, autobiographical narrative parts of this literature, it turns out that Peter is not the leader of the church. That's what, that's what struck me very strongly as I was doing that teaching and ultimately, well, I hate to say blew my mind, but it, it did explode within my mind that we have a different picture of what was going on here in these narrative uh, portions of the literature that are more reliable than the, shall we say, more literary portions of the literature. So at this point, the we documents, but you see, Paul, we are all, meaning we are all, are all zealots for the law. Well, that just would bang you right in the face. It's in Acts. It's in the wee portion of Acts. When you see a line like that, that you know is historical because no one could have created out of the blue, then you know there's a lot of non-historical material that has been created in all these other uh, 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 compositions. And just that line alone should blow your mind. But you see, Paul, we are all zealots for the law. Well, we didn't know early Christians were zealots for the law. We never heard that. Paul's no zealot for the law. Paul makes us think that the law brings a curse. 
the law brings death. Jesus brings life. I mean, he's, all of his letters are arguing against the law so powerfully that we as Christians or we who think we're Christians, I'm not one of those, but the one, you know, I'm speaking like that, uh, um, um, think that the law is something negative. You know, and here James, the leader of the church, is saying we are all not only for the law, we are zealots for the law. And we see, Paul, that, you know, you don't go into the temple. And we have some men here who are under Nazarite oath. That's a very particular form of the law. And they need, uh, you know, and they have to go into the temple to purify themselves and they have to pay some expenses. So we would like you, because we know you have a lot of money. You've come from overseas. You've been raising money. You, you, please go into the temple with some of your colleagues there and pay for some of these people we have there under Nazarite oath. And Paul, nothing though, says, sure, I, I, uh, I will do that. I will do that. We know that he despises the temple, that he despises Nazarite oath, that he despises the law. And yet we see what kind of a character he is. That's why I'm not a big fan of Paul. Because Paul, to my mind, is very, um, how shall we put it, flexible. <laughs> and not only flexible, he is not a person of principle. He he runs the race to win, as he says in one of his letters. I believe in winning, not beating the air. I think that's in uh, either 1 Corinthians, I think that's in 1 Corinthians or, or, or uh, Romans. And that expresses his mentality. Well, we're all, uh, all the runners at the stadium are running for the, for, for, the, for, for the prize. I believe in running for the final prize. I believe in winning, not beating the air. He uses the imagery of Roman stadium athletics. That would never happen in the scrolls. That would never happen in Palestine. That would only happen for a, uh, for, for, to a, in a Hellenized mindset. So what I have tried to show from the letter to the Romans that Paul is not just someone from Tarsus. He's very important. He's not just someone from Tarsus because at the end of Romans, and I credit those greetings, he sends greetings to some members of the Herodian family who have been exiled because of the Jewish war that Josephus writes about at the time he's writing these things to Rome. And, you know, he says, send my regards to my kinsman Herodion in Rome, his kinsman Herodion. Herodion means the littlest Herod, the youngest Herod, his kinsman. So it came to me my mind, and that's how I started developing these uh, essays and points that I have, that Paul is actually from the Herodian family. Now, the Herodian family were seen as very good rulers by the Romans, and they had little kingdoms given them in northern Syria and in Asia Minor. That's why he comes from Tarsus, because whoever were his family there probably did rule a Roman province. Yeah, by the way, and that's why he has a Roman citizenship, because the, Ro because the, the Herodians were given Roman citizenship. This is where my details begin to uh, lose me. I think all the way back in Pompey's time, oh, with the Gospels, he's executed because the Romans and made a mistake and the, and the Jews plotted against him. Well, all of that is just hocus, to my mind, hocus. I hate to say that. You know, the Romans, Pontius Pilate didn't make mistakes. He crucified more, we know from Josephus, he crucified more people than just about any other Roman governor. He knew exactly who he was crucifying and why and wanted to. And I don't think if, if it's true that he crucified Jesus, that there was any mistake whatsoever made and the Jews didn't pull the wool over his eyes. So these are things I disagree with the Gospels about. Now, the moment you start disagreeing with the Gospels, then you're hurting Christians' feelings. Then you're hurting their religious beliefs because these things have become over 20 centuries sacrosanct. No, who's ever questioned these things? Nobody in their right mind has ever questioned these things. Maybe some people were burnt in the Middle Ages who questioned such things, but no one with any historical knowledge has ever questioned such things. So people have just taken these things as absolute truth. But as I say uh, in my work, ultimately, these are the products of literature. And, 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 and to my mind, literature is a very facile form of history. In other words, it's much easier to form a belief about literature because it can be formed and structured in a certain way. 
and it's easy to remember. I mean, I remember the Iliad, I remember the Odyssey, but I don't remember all the Greek history concerning Alexander the Great and all the different uh, political plots in Athens and in Sparta and all these things. And everything in Palestine would be almost uh, too complicated if you read Josephus. He's written two huge works, the Jewish War and the Antiquities about this. The Antiquities is like a thousand pages. And you know, to, to master all that material would be mind boggling. So the Gospels are vari three, four variations on basically the same theme, and they're very easy to digest, and they're easy to, uh, to enjoy, and they have some concepts in them that are very attractive, so people uh, do uh, find themselves uh, uh, feeling very close to them. But if you want to start getting into, is this an accurate picture of what occurred in Palestine in the first century, then there are people like me who say, oh, oh, hold on a moment. That may be an accurate picture of what some people painted in Rome and Alexandria, but that may not be uh, uh, exactly what occurred in Palestine. And then, bam, the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered in the 18, uh, 1880s or, 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 or 1947, but some came in earlier. The Zadokite document was discovered in Cairo in the um, Geniza in the 1890s and so on, and you began to see other kinds of documents coming, other kinds of messianic documents. And then we did get the caves during the Arab-Israeli War, 47, 48. And once we got all these documents out, which is why I was so anxious in the 80s to fight the campaign that everyone should see all of the, all of the documents. Once we could see all of the documents, see how consistent they were, see how messianic they were, then we could see that we had an opposition, messianic movement in Palestine that had a complete literature that had been totally inverted and reversed in the Gospels. So the Gospels are good, I have nothing wrong with them. They're beautiful literature. The ideals enunciated are wonderful. But that the, I don't say the scroll, I'm not a believer in the scrolls, I don't say the scrolls are the most marvelous uh, documents in the, in the, in the universe, but they are not what was occurring in Palestine. They are a Hellenized, uh, uh, Romanized version of, uh, uh, they're a Greco-Roman uh, version of what the Romans felt comfortable with. That is, Roman centurions are pictured as recognizing the Messiah before Jews do. You know, uh, love your enemies, don't make war against the Roman Empire, you know, and so on and so forth. All this is, is very convenient to help these documents survive in a Roman imperial framework, which is what they would do and ultimately become, dominate the Roman Empire by the three, four hundreds. So uh, my only argument, I don't argue with the beauty of these documents, my only argument is the historicity. So. I, uh, my, 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 my whole thing has been from the, from the beginning, that one is literature and the other is history. You want to just do literature, fine. If you want to do history, then you have to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you go to, you may not love them, but if you want to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll get a more accurate picture of the historical Jesus than you will from the Gospels. Why? Well, first I'll explain his execution, absolutely, not in the explanation you get in the Gospels, which is, to my mind, contrived, because, as I just said earlier, Pontius Pilate didn't hesitate to crucify anybody, and he didn't have Jews convincing him of who to, of who to crucify. And, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but the other thing is that the, um, the scrolls give you a picture of what the Jamesian community probably looked like. I mean, we have this character that pops up in early church literature and we don't understand it. Everywhere we hear about Eusebius in the fourth century, Hippolytus in the second or third, uh, you know, Jerome in the fifth, we start hearing about this person called James the Just. Well, who is James the Just? James Justus, J-U-S-T-U-S, -U -S, that's Latin. It goes back to dikaios in Greek, righteous, and Zadik in Hebrew, James the Tzadik, James the, the, the Tzadik. Ah, when I go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, I can find out who the Tzadik was because the scrolls are all centered around the idea of Zadokite, Zedek, Zadik, uh, righteousness, Zadik. And their leader is known as 
the teacher of righteousness, the Moray Hatzedek. And where do they get the Moray Hatzedek from, the teacher of righteousness? They take biblical passages, and everywhere the word Zadik appears that is convenient for them, they interpret in terms of something the teacher of righteousness was, was doing. So in the text, he's the Tzadik. In the interpretation of the text, he's the teacher of righteousness. And what is James? The teacher of righteousness in the Christian literature. And so this began to gel for me. Oh, and by the way, one last thing. As I said at the end of my James book, who and whatever James was, it had to be, so was Jesus. And someone in, in that environment knew that James was the successor to Jesus, and, 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 and so it pops up in the, in the Gospel of Thomas. That doesn't mean that I take every word in the Gospel of Thomas as authentic. And this is the problem. The, the believer is not on the level of being able to determine what is authentic and what isn't authentic. This is a very, even scholars don't agree with each other on this and tack each other, or, uh, insult each other where this is concerned and, 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 and have a very low opinion of each other in this regard. So it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, an, it's an unpleasant activity to find what is authentic and what isn't authentic. And that's where common sense comes into play. To my mind, common sense comes into play. So I start with a few passages. Even the one you mentioned, the Gospel of Thomas, is attractive, but I'm not sure it's reliable. I start with a few passages that I know are reliable, like the passages I told you about from Acts 21, 21. It is so mind-boggling and so uh, 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 brutally direct that you can't imagine someone created it. And besides that, what transpires thereafter, Paul does go into the temple. That shows that he is not someone who, who is, has very deep-seated uh, adherence to a belief system that he's going to follow absolutely if it doesn't uh, uh, serve his purposes. It serves his purposes here to ingratiate himself to James and appear like he's doing, like he's doing uh, you know, what a follower of James is supposed to do. But the people in the temple who know him better start shrieking and yelling, even in Acts. This is the man who teaches against us here, everywhere in Asia, and all these, and they yell and shriek. And that, you know, is an authentically accurate picture of what was going to end. It creates a riot. And they take him out and throw him out and, it said, and barred the door behind him. That's actually one of the phrases in one of the scrolls, the, data, the, the Damascus document, I think, or the Habakkuk pressure, pressure meaning uh, interpretation. So, you, you, you know, these are, these are, to my mind, things that really hit you, hit you hard and you know are probably correct. The point being there is, is, is that they throw, they have a riot. They don't kill him, but they throw Paul out of the temple. They would have been willing to kill him because they know he's a lawbreaker. They know he's bringing non-believers who are lawbreakers into the temple. And they're very, I don't agree with them. They're, they're not, I don't say the temple, the temple goers are nice people. I don't say that they're perfect. They're, they're zealots. They're zealous. They're, you know, if I go into the temple today, religious people in the, in the, in the uh, Machna Yehuda area of Jerusalem would maybe attack me. You know, these people are zealots. Okay, they're zealots. We know what zealots are like. And, but that's authentic picture. But the point is that how does Paul survive? He pulls out a Roman passport, if you want, citizenship. Do you, uh, do you, do you do this to Roman citizens? And then the, the Roman soldiers who are on watch over in, on their ramparts come down and rescue him and escort him, a protective escort, down to Caesarea on his way to Rome. He does then appear before the governor and so on. That's all authentic material. You know that that's authentic historical material. That is accurate. That's how he gets to Rome finally. He's been there probably before, but that's how he's saved. Romans save him. And he's saved because he's an Herodian, because he's got a Roman citizenship. Now, that's not my prophet. That's not my prophet. So right away, I take the Pauline corpus and set it aside, good for historical purposes, but not for spiritual enlightenment for me. I'm not having a Herodian teacher. I apologize. I think Herod is a monster. Herod is ancestor. Herod did everything he could to, to destroy the Jewish people. Herod destroyed the Maccabean family. Herod undermined the Maccabean uh, legacy. 
and the scrolls are doing everything they can not necessarily destroy uh, restore the Maccabeans but to destroy to to restore the, the legacy so as someone from a Jewish background even my rabbinic friends don't agree with me I mean Christians agree with me more than than than, than my rabbinic friends because Christians know that I'm saying something that relates to what they know too the thing is that's why Christians that's why they're attracted to my uh, to my to to my work because it's meaningful to them Whereas to the average Jew doesn't know what I'm talking about. Doesn't know what I'm talking about. The average Jew, you know, believes in the Gospels more than the average Christian. Not as salvationary documents. You say, oh, well, this information has been around for 2,000 years. It must be correct. What, what's there to question here? I know they, they don't even question it. it. Came down through these various stages of the Roman Empire, into the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, to up to the present time. And the literature of Christianity is become something that is widely accepted across that whole spectrum. But the behavior patterns of the peoples who have accepted this literary expression are totally unchristian because the Christian nations, if we can call them that, are some of the most warlike nations in the world. They've been fighting wars ever since Roman times. And by the time of our own time, the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, we've had some of the most terrible wars imaginable between and among Christian nations. Different kinds of Christian nations, Orthodox maybe and so on, but still Christian nations and believing Christians fighting these wars. So the whole the documents of love your enemy and all this sort of thing are not exemplified in their, in their behavior patterns. So what should one look for if one is looking for a salvationary doctrine, I mean, the doctrine is fine, but nobody, uh, no, uh, no, nobody follows. I have nothing against uh, some of the ideas expressed. They're very, 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 they're very, very beautiful. And I come down to the idea of righteousness. I mean, the kings from David on down to the prophets aren't very, uh, aren't, after Solomon, aren't very uh, inspiring. So, I mean, that's the literature of a people. You're not supposed to, you know, identify with every single, single bit of it. But the righteousness idea, I think, is the central core of what is being um, of what is being aimed at, and I think that's in the prophets. I think it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think it's in everyone's heart. So, if you want me to say finally what I think should it comes down to, I think people have an intuitive understanding of what righteousness is. If I see a little boy a crippled boy, let's say, and a man over here making fun of him or persecuting him or, 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 or tormenting him, my heart automatically reacts against that. And I know that that's unrighteous, that that is not right, that that is not good. And I have an inner sense of right and good. It doesn't come from any scripture. It doesn't come from any, any, any teaching. It's in my soul. And I think people know uh, in their soul what is right. Maybe not every right and wrong, whether you should sleep with a man or sleep with a woman or have a mistress or not have a mistress or these kinds of sexual things which are very complicated, which everyone has a different approach to depending on what's being written. I can't comment on that. But on the general things of what is right and how one should behave in a, in a righteous way, treating one's children in a just manner, treating one's neighbor in a just manner, you know, uh, not cheating someone in business or in, 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 in things of that. All these kinds of things, I think, are, are, are clear. You see, you have literary documents where, where, where this kind of thing is expressed. You have the Gospels where these things are expressed in a literary form. Did this actually happen? That is the question. My mind, I don't know if these things uh, ha actually happen like that. The scroll documents don't usually tell stories about anyone. They've already got the old biblical stories that they've already copied and, you know, they obviously value them and consider them very uh, holy or sacred or important. But in their individual writings themselves, they do write about things happening in their time and the things that happen to the righteous teacher and the righteous teacher is obviously killed by somebody it seems and so on and so forth and those things you can put in a historical context and i think what we have there is the literature of this final war against the romans not that it was all written at that time 
but the literature that led up to it, including John the Baptist type of material, we have a, we have a, a presentation of material that certainly is contemporary with w w who the New Testament calls John the Baptist, or Josephus originally spoke about him. And, 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 and I would say John the Baptist was either a, 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 a partisan of the scrolls or a kindred spirit out in the wilderness to the scrolls people because he was out where the scrolls uh, uh, were uh, um, surely uh, um, um, together in the, the Qumran area, which is right near some of the areas we associate with John the Baptist. And um, where he was, uh, and of course across the, I've been over there in Jordan in Makaras, where he supposedly was killed. And um, obviously those areas had a lot of interest to the writers of the scrolls. They lived in those areas, they settled in those areas. And don't forget, the, the scroll material was ultimately also found on Masada. Now Masada, is a place where everyone committed suicide. Families, children, wives, rather than surrender to Rome. Rather than surrender to Rome and give their children or wives as Roman servants or mistresses or slaves. They preferred death. And to my mind, this is the mindset of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what do you know? The scroll, some scrolls were found there. And what do you know in addition? Immersion pools as well. But in addition, we have a Roman historian of the th second, third century, Hippolytus, that tells us there were four kinds of Essenes. And the last two kinds of Essenes are not the kind our scholars love to seize upon as being the scroll writers. And if you look upon the Essenes that Josephus describes there, Nothing like the scrolls that if you read them, but they are they are he what he calls zealot Essenes and Sicari Essenes. Oh well, that's mind blowing. Hippolytus says there were two groups that were called zealot Essenes or Sicari Essenes. Well, the zealots we just heard about in that Acts passage raised the war against Rome. Josephus tells you all about them, but what about the Sicari? Who were the Sicari? Josephus tells us that too. We know that the Sicarii uh, are named after the Roman word for knife, sica, which they held sort of like the Arabs did, that curved dagger uh, that continued into Arab times in their, uh, on their breast or whatever, that they held in, uh, under a shirt on their breast or somewhere. And therefore they were known as Sicarii because they had the curved dagger. And they, but they didn't use the curved dagger as decoration these people in Palestine who had the dagger were assassinating Herodian, Herodian uh, satraps, Herodian, you know, uh, uh, sympathizer type people, traitors. They were, and it's all in Josephus, they were killing people who were, who were betraying the Jewish historical heritage and, and preparing to live under Roman Herodian dominance. And therefore, Josephus hates them. He calls them Sicarii. But Hippolytus says they're Sicarii Essenes. And we hear that the final withdrawal place in the war against Rome caused by the Zealots, the last most extreme party were the Sicarii. And guess what? They withdrew to Masada. Josephus tells us he knows he was there. And, and he escaped somehow. But the point, you know, no, he was with the Romans anyway. And, and he witnessed the mass suicide there. And he said, the, 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 the Sicarii committed suicide there. Who were the Sicarii Essenes? Sicarii Essenes are actually the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Zealot Sicarii Essenes and Zealot Christians in the sense that we are all Zealots here of the Jamesian community. I'm not trying to say that they're warlike. They're only warlike in the sense they're not prepared to surrender to the brutality of the Roman Empire and give their children over to Roman slavery, to being, to being raped by, uh, by, by Roman soldiers, to being kept as, as um, uh, you know, uh, basic uh, chattel and, you know, uh, uh, whores uh, by, uh, by Roman uh, 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 soldiery or officials and so on and so forth. They weren't prepared for this. They would rather fight 
and they would rather kill their offspring. You have to respect them. I mean, I, I, I would want to be in their position. They were extremely brave. They were extremely, they were just, they were just of the extreme righteousness and they were prepared to go to the final degree. Some escaped. That's the crazy thing. In the scrolls, it speaks of the camps, the, the wilderness camps in the land of Damascus. In the la that's in the Damascus document. There are wilderness camps. It speaks, why do we need wilderness camps? We know about going into the wilderness in the, in the gospel literature. We need wilderness camps because the people preparing for the final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth, they can't be married. They, they, because marriage brings all kinds of other issues, sin and different kinds of things like that, they have to be perfectly pure. And the reason they have to be perfectly pure, they have to immerse themselves, they have to be to baptize themselves, they have to be daily bathers, they have to be, go and be purified every single day, because the camps must be perfectly pure. And why? Because they know they can't win this war with the few people that they have. They need the heavenly host. And we don't understand that for them, the heavenly host is, are the warrior angels. That the heavenly host is a force like a hundred atomic bombs. And you see, there's something beyond our... These people were very creative. They understood the heavenly host. And they, I mean, they, they may have been nuts. And we would say, what stupid people? They believe this nonsense? Yes, they believed it to the point of death. They believed it. They went to these camps, and so some of these camps out in the wilderness in, in Syria and, and northern Iraq survived. And we get remnants of them all into the Arabian Peninsula. Some of them actually, a few survived, I think, into Muhammad's time and became teachers of him in caves. Don't forget Muhammad is learning his doctrine on the caravan trade from Mesopotamia to Mecca, but he's also studying in caves. There are teachers in these caves. The scroll people are always in caves. The point being, I'm not trying to make uh, superficial uh, uh, parallelisms, but there were teachers who were teaching him, and the teaching is very similar to what we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Islam has a lot of material in common with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not in common with Judaism, not in common with Christianity. More like an extreme apocalyptic militantism. And yes, they are. And by the way, this baptism is only an initiation in the Christian view of it. That's correct. It's a, it, it, for the Essenes of these different groups, it's, it's, a, it's a constant daily routine of keeping purification. So you may have to start by being purified, but then you must keep it up and keep it up and keep it up and keep it up. But the reason you're keeping it up is because you are preparing for the coming of the heavenly host among you. See, the heavenly host as they saw it, and they may have been nuts, okay, but they were creatively nuts. I think it's very, 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 very beautiful. I, I don't believe it necessarily, but the heavenly host as they saw it could not abide human impurity, or they could not go back up to heaven. To be in heaven, they had to be totally pure. So if they came down to earth and, and, and stood alongside human beings to help them and be with them, there couldn't be any pollution or impurity in the camp with them. It had to be perfectly pure, and that's what these wilderness camps were. It's an incredibly beautiful, if you like Christianity, it's also just like that. It's an incredibly beautiful picture of the universe that we underestimate tremendously. The only faith I have is in the concept of righteousness. If what you are doing makes you into a more righteous person, that's uh, fine as far as I'm concerned. To my mind, God, if you want to speak in such terms, that it makes one demand on, it, on people to be righteous. It doesn't tell you to believe this, believe that, believe on Jesus and you will be saved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Believe on Moses and you will be saved, believe on Muhammad, whatever. No, uh, just be righteous. That doesn't mean you're going to be saved because I don't even know there is a, if there is such a thing as salvation. I don't, can't say that. I'm just saying we live in this world and I know what high behavior is and I know what low behavior is. And I think it is better to behave in a high manner than in a low manner. And I think one be feels better. The only problem is economically, this might not bring the advantages behaving in a low manner brings. So people are tempted in, in many ways to go and do things that they might not wish to do otherwise. I can't help the economic factors of behaving in, in a high manner. I choose as far as possible 
to behave in the highest manner I can conceivably uh, behave in. And that's what I think um, is people are called upon to do. And I don't think there's any book that tells me how to do it. It's in my and your soul. You know how to do it. So uh, the literature can be attractive. If it helps you do that, fine. But don't tell me that that's history. <laughs>